Welcome to the Resilience Series. I'm Stephanie Weaver, the author of the Migraine Relief Plan and the upcoming Migraine Relief Plan Cookbook. And for that project, I'm interviewing a variety of people on the topic of resilience. My guest today is Dr. Lindsay Weitzel. Dr. Weitzel works full-time as a migraine patient strategist. She's a migraine medical writer, the author of Super Zoe, The Migraine Hero, a graphic novel for kids, the host of the Heads Up podcast for the National Headache Foundation, and the founder of Migraine Nation on Facebook. Welcome, Dr. Weitzel. Hello, thank you for having me. So happy to be here. So let's start with your migraine journey. Uh, tell us a little bit about when it started, um, kind of your uh, additional thing of uh, CRPS and what that looked like in your life. Sure. Um, I, my very first memory is of a migraine. I had chronic daily migraine from the time I was four until I was 30. Uh, so my first memory, sadly, is swinging in a swing at preschool, shielding my eyes from the sun um, because I had a migraine. I got this from my father. He also had migraine from a very young age. Um, it seems from his stories that it was probably chronic when he was pretty young. Um, and so it, the, the problem that happened to me was that the pain was so incessant from so many years and from such an early age that I ended up getting uh, something called complex regional pain syndrome um, and the right on um, my right face, head, neck area, and it eventually went down my right arm. And that's kind of like a burning fire that goes down to your bones. It's very difficult. So I had that from, I really don't know what age it first showed up, but I had that under the migraine pain. So that was uh, very debilitating for me. I do think I sort of blame the CRPS for um, disrupting my life around the age of 15, the migraine, obviously, did the was the cause the main cause of the problem but i was a competitive swimmer i had to quit it really disrupted my grades um i can say that um when they came out with sumatriptan i was 17 and that helped a lot it didn't allow me to be an athlete but it did help me in school so um that did at least help the migraine it obviously didn't help the crps so um, but that is my story of when migraine started. I now consider myself after the age of 30, I try not, I'm not one of those people that likes to keep track of my migraines. I believe it makes me feel sicker. I don't keep a diary. Um, but I am like 90% better. I consider myself episodic. I can't say that I get less than 15 days of migraine a month every month but um i i definitely more of an episodic type pattern now and what happened when you were 30 that you think impacted your pattern well remember that i am someone that had this my whole life so i spent my whole life uh sort of building a lifestyle around less migraine less pain it was um what i was you know, doing from the time I was born was figuring out ways to, to keep the pain away, whether it was daily exercise. I do have a very exercise dependent migraine disorder. I have to exercise every day, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's part of what helped, but they also, that is the year that they started prescribing Topamax for people with migraine. And I remember almost laughing at the thought of trying it because, you know, once you've tried everything under the sun um, and strangely, it was a huge turnaround for me. It helped me with both the burning pain and the migraine pain. Oh, I'm so glad that something <laughs> was able to change things for you, which yeah. is really wonderful. And everything's getting better and better. We have more and more meds available to us now. Thank goodness. Yes, absolutely. So what is a migraine strategist and how did you become one? So I love explaining what I do because it is such a strange word and people are like, what is that? Um, as a lot of people know, we have less than a thousand uh, certified headache providers in America to serve over 38 million of us that have migraine. And so there's so many people falling through the cracks. I have a PhD in analytical health sciences. I have a master's in nutrition and I'm a yoga teacher and I've had this my whole life. And so what I do is I work as an adjunct to physicians. I work with a lot of these people who have either fallen through the cracks or just have had, most people I work with, honestly, extremely sick, have had chronic migraine for years and years and just are not getting better and have sort of given up. And um, 
I basically build, what I say I do is I build rock walls against migraine. And I picture rocks of different sizes and each of those rocks is an anti-migraine strategy. And I always say that half that wall is your lifestyle factors. Half of it is your medicines. And then the mortar that holds it all together is your mentality. And I help people build these rock walls against their migraine disorder. And I think for a lot of people, it really does take someone who really understands them and has been where they are. And they really like that adjunct, that extra person on the side to help them through the process. And that is what I do. That's awesome. And also you're able to spend more time than a physician is going to be able to spend. Very much so. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So with your background in nutrition, you have two undergraduate degrees in nutrition. So how have you seen food choices impacting migraine disease and the clients that you work with or yourself? Either you can answer both. I would say, so the the way I like to answer this is, um, there are, um, a lot of people know this, there's 44 genetic loci that we know of that contribute to migraine and its symptoms. So we are very diverse. Uh, none of us with, I'm not like you, you're not like me, we're not, I'm not like the last guest you had on here when it comes to our migraine disorder. And so you cannot expect to be like anybody else when it comes to what contributes to your migraine. We might have some similarities, but we are all very different. And so I can say personally, that it, I, it was strange to me when I very first started working with people who had to go through a big process to discover what their food triggers were, right? Because for whatever reason, and I do think it has something to do with the fact that I have CRPS, if I ate something that was a trigger for me, it was almost an immediate thing that I was in pain. And so I knew my triggers for years. They were so obvious to me, right? Other people, their triggers, it might not be an immediate thing. And they do have to keep track and do a diary. And it takes them weeks and weeks to figure that out. And I find I always found that very interesting. And so um, it, I have met a couple people, and it blew my mind, um, who maybe don't even come across as a t- on a test that they're sensitive to gluten. And when we remove gluten from their diet, their migraines improve drastic, drastically. I have no explanation for that in my education, but if it works, it works. So um, it's a little bit mysterious. I don't have an explanation for many of the things I've seen help people. Um, and I do, diet obviously plays a role. I've seen things that are bad for you or things that most people would think are good for you that just for some reason trigger people's pain or their, their migraine. So we're all very different. And if you are noticing something in your diet that you think, think makes you feel worse, even if it doesn't make sense, get rid of it. Thank you. (laughs) That's, that's helpful. And also I think, uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that migraine is an inflammatory condition. Mm -hmm. And so things like sugar and gluten can contribute to inflammation, therefore contributing to inflammation in the brain and making you just more susceptible to an attack. It doesn't cause it, but it's more Mm -hmm. susceptible. So there's that that slight difference of an actual food that can be a trigger. Like I'm a little bit like you and that there's particular cheese, kombucha, very specific things that I've known for years was a problem and I shouldn't eat them. And, um, and that's why it always made me like very question, like, well, isn't everybody like this? Like why, but, and why aren't doctors more, you know, more supportive of nutrition, uh, a nutritional approach is, um, right. it's because everybody's so different and that's what makes it hard. That's why the list of potential foods is so long and yeah. et cetera. Okay. I don't spend a lot of time on the why. To be honest, I just, if, if it's, if it's causing you pain, don't eat it. Um, I (laughs) I love that. I, I, and and I'm a scientist and I know I just, we spend so much time wondering why. I mean, the best example is red wine honestly will make me feel better. White wine will give me a migraine. It's the opposite of everything we've ever been taught. Yeah. I could dig into some reasons and come up with some hypotheses for why that is, but who cares? I just don't drink white wine, you know? And so, um, it's, it's one of those things where you don't really need to explain it to anyone. If, if someone's questioning you on, you know, that shouldn't be causing you migraine. Well, it doesn't matter. You don't need to explain, just don't eat it. There you go. I love <laughs> it. Simple. 
So how, uh, why did you write your graphic novel for kids? Tell us about that. Yeah, uh, so I do have a graphic novel for kids with migraine. I say it's also good for adventurous adults. There's some adults who love it. I wrote it for a couple of reasons. I wrote it because I was a little kid who thought I was the only person in the world who's head hurt every day or who got migraine. By the way, I was not diagnosed with migraine until I was 17. I was told I had sinus headaches. So I felt very alone. And um, I want kids, A, to not feel alone, but B, it works as a wonderful distraction technique and a, a technique to um, empower kids when they're in pain. Instead of their mind kind of going down the hole, them getting sad or feeling isolated, it gives them an, a very empowering tool. Hey, you know, this, this person in this graphic novel has migraine and she's sort of a superhero and she gains strength from the experience as opposed to feeling down. And it's also, it's a little bit, uh, the, the drawings in the graphic novel are sort of cleverly done. I did not draw it. I can't even draw stick figures, but um, Zoe sort of changes age on different pages. So re regardless of what age the kid is, there, there should be a page where they can sort of relate to her age. Um, so I just want them to have something. There's not many words so that they don't have to read, you know, while they have a migraine because that would make them feel worse. It's mostly pictures. So there's something empowering for them to focus on. That's wonderful. How do you define resilience? So I define it, you know, resilience is technically, you know, how you recover, how quickly you recover from uh, something tough that, that happened, which is, which is true. It's lovely. That's what resilience is, but I really try, um, I feel like the goal as people with migraine or with chronic pain that, you know, you're going, you deal with over the long term, is maybe to look at resilience as um, when life tries to knock you down, you learn to either not fall or not fall as far. And, um, and in, in that way, maybe you don't have to see it as, okay, now I have to recover again. I have to learn how to be this person who's constantly recovering. And, um, and you, it, it also, I think one of the skills that we learn to build in that process is um, all the emotions that, that uh, either people put on us or we put on ourselves when we're stuck in bed and we can't be at work and we can't show up for some of the things that maybe we wanna show up for or people want us to show up for, like shame and guilt and these things. There's no place for that. We don't need that. And eventually, I think we need to learn to just say no to those emotions. And um, I think that that plays a big role in resilience because if we're able to say no to these negative feelings and these negative emotions, we don't get knocked down as far. And, and so I hope that made sense. But to me, that plays a really big role in being resilient when you are someone with migraine. I love that. Uh, what are some self-care resilience strategies that you personally find most helpful? You mentioned exercise, but what are some of the others? And what does exercise look like for you? Right. And, and so this is one of the things I do as a migraine strategist is I exercise with people because um, we, as people with migraine, exercise can be a huge trigger. So it can be something that keeps the migraine away, but it can also be a giant trigger. So most people I work with are scared to death exercise, which makes perfect sense because it's caused them pain forever. So um, I see um, like the resilience tools that I use myself as two things. I keep myself as physically and mentally fit as humanly possible so that when a huge migraine or a huge pain flare comes to bring me down, I was as high as I could possibly be and there's wiggle room. You need that wiggle room and you need it more than the average person who doesn't have a chronic illness, right? So I believe that that means that people with migraine have to be, I, I, I hate, I don't want to use this word in case not everyone relates to it, but it's almost like you have to be a mental superhero and you have to keep yourself at such a high level. So I honestly probably spend 40 minutes every morning in a, in like a either meditating or doing something that gets my mind in a really strong place, whatever it is to you. So when I work with people, I'm like, do you hate meditation? Do you like meditation? Is there 
a, what can we do that gets your mind and just like a, just super glues it in a strong place each morning, right? And then I have to work out before I take my beta blocker. A beta blocker is one of the things I have to take every day. And for those people who take a beta blocker, working out after your beta blocker is not an easy task. And so I work out uh, in the morning, usually. I'm a runner and a swimmer. I usually do one of those two things. And I also do yoga when I can. Of course, COVID has made that difficult unless you want to do it on your own. And so, and I did it on my own for a while, but I really got tired of that. So I usually do one of those three things. And um, for me personally, raising my heart rate is one of the things I, I think it has to do with getting my blood pumping that keeps migraine away. A lot of people I work with, we just do yoga. Um, I work with people who raising their heart rate even a little bit gives them a migraine and we have other things that we do. So, um, but that's what it means to me is getting your mental, mental and physical fitness high enough that you have wiggle room for it to go down depending on where, where your pain is going to take you that day or, or gosh, you know, it might take you down for three days. It might take you down for a week or two. So you got to get up there. That's how I feel. That's great. I just wanted to respond a little bit. Um, so yeah. I have, uh, fibromyalgia and migraine and a thyroid thing going on. Yeah. So, um, so for me, what Lindsay described is not what mine looks like, but I do very similar things. So every morning I go for a walk for about 30 minutes. Okay. I would say my heart rate's lightly elevated because if I do too much, then I'll get a fibromyalgia flare yeah. and then I won't be able to walk for three days. So it's this very gentle, but very regular exercise that I've built up to super gradually. So like if I was starting out at 3000 steps a day, I do find it's helpful to have use your smartphone or pedometer or fitness tracker or any of those things. Mm -hmm. um, pedometers can cost like 10 bucks. So if you don't have those other options, you know, those are available. And if you're walking 2,500 steps a day, just do that consistently for a week, then add 250 steps to your goal, okay. then add 250 again, eventually you'll get to 10,000 steps or 11,000 steps or around four to five miles a day, which is what I walk, but I walk it in four or five walks a day. Mm -hmm. That's what works for me. After my right. morning walk, I come back, I have a 10 minute seated yoga practice. That's very, very, very gentle. It's not what I would like to be able to do in terms of right. yoga, but it's what my body is okay with. And then I meditate for 10 minutes. And that combination of that 20 to 30 minute walk, sometimes it's a little longer, that 20 minutes on the mat, completely changes the rest of my day. So right. if, if what Lindsay just described Made, made you feel like, oh my God, I could never do that. Right. Just just realize that you can start very small. You can start with a three minute meditation. You can just listen to um, like there's wonderful guided meditations out there that are free. Um, just listen to one of those. It really does change your brain and it helps with the reactivity of our brains. Yeah. And that I, I believe helps reduce the potential for migraine. It's not that it's a cure or anything, but there's a lot of evidence now around meditation and that some of those strategies is really being helpful. So I just wanted to, yeah. if anybody was listening and was like, oh, well, I can't work out. I couldn't do those things. I can't do those things either, but I do something similar. And my version of it works for me. It's kind of like what you were saying earlier with the food. Like if you know something works for you or doesn't work for you, just don't do those things. Mm -hmm. I, I'm really glad you said that because um, so when I started meditating, it took me years to learn to meditate. First of all, I used to have to move when I meditated because I couldn't sit still for two minutes. So I literally started with a one minute meditation, but I've been an athlete my whole life. And this is the exercise that works for me. And most of the people I exercise with as a strategist, we walk, we start either walking or doing yoga. Um, and so and a lot of the people I work with can't even raise their heart rate at first without getting a migraine. And I think it's 40, I wish I had this statistic right on the top of my tongue, but I think it's at least 40% of us with migraine have kinesiophobia, which means we're scared to move, we're scared to exercise because it gives us a migraine. And so it's totally normal to be afraid to work out at all. Um, and it's totally normal to even need someone to help you to even get started. Um, and so I usually start with people not even using their upper body because I've personally noticed that upper body 
movements um, are one of the big triggers um, for people who are triggered by exercise. So um, definitely, it's definitely something you have to usually work up to. Yeah, thank you for that. And I think it's, I didn't even call it exercise in my book. I called it movement because I think the word exercise can be sort of um, triggering for people uh, in a different use of the term trigger. Uh -huh. um, and so, you know, it's something where it feels intimidating or if you're not a lifelong athlete, like I'm not, um, you know, that just doesn't feel realistic. Like, and, and especially if you have the kind of chronic pain conditions that we both have, you know, you'll, I remember being at some party or something and some woman saying, oh my God, I have this great personal trainer and you should call him and that he would be so great for you. And I was like, no. <laughs> And, and I just couldn't, I didn't even have the energy to explain why I would love to be able to do that, right. but that is just not something that my body right. is really going to support. So even um, physical therapists, I have a hard time finding physical therapists to send people to who aren't going to trigger their migraine. Yeah. I mean, it's, it is, it is tough because there's the sort of normal way bodies respond to things mm -hmm. like exercise and PT. And then there's the way our bodies respond. And it's easy to get in the frame of mind of, oh, that means there's one other thing wrong with me instead of just accepting that, you know what, this is how it is. I used to feel badly that I wasn't working out. And then I was talking to my friend yesterday and she's like, well, how much are you walking now? I thought you walked in the morning. And I was like, oh, well, I walk five times a day. And she's like, oh my gosh. I said, well, that's how I walk five miles a day. I don't, walk, you, it. Yeah. I don't walk it all at once because that would kill me, <laughs> exactly. but I walk a half mile or 0. 0.6 or, you know, I have these little loops. So if I've been sitting doing something like this, after this, I'll probably go out and just walk around a couple blocks and that gradually builds up. And that's what I've learned works for me. So I just want to encourage everyone to, regardless of what your current state is, to trust that very gradual incremental changes do make a difference and they are worth trying. So if it's a minute of meditation and if it's a three minute walk, start there because you are going to eventually get to a place where those things are part of your lifestyle mm -hmm. and they do start to feel good and and also just being aware that i like i didn't know that heart rate rate raising heart rate can trigger migraines i knew yes intense exercise did but i didn't realize it was the heart rate change so that's helpful for people to know because then they can say oh okay well i can watch my heart rate and how slowly do i need to walk in order to not to still be okay and then you can kind of play a game with it and say hey this seems like it works and i'll just walk two blocks at this pace but i'll do it 10 times a day mm -hmm. so there are ways around it and i feel like sort of i have to kind of sneak up on my body and do things that are good for it but whatever works right yep and i can say too um because i i think it's important for people to know i've truly been an athlete my whole life swimmer runner and there's only one yoga series one and i've tried a lot that i found that i can do without triggering migraine and it's not the same for everyone else it's a yoga series that honestly triggers it for most people so it's i and i can't hold my arms up and leave them there without being triggered and so um it's it I think most of us are triggered by some sort of movement and it's probably different for a little bit different for everyone. So, and I think it's encouraging to know this because then you don't feel like, Oh, I'm a failure at another no. thing. It's just mm -hmm. like, Oh, let me figure out what works. And yep. maybe let me try just seated yoga, chair yoga, lying on the floor stuff. Mm -hmm. um, five minutes, you know, and um, I mean, I would love to be able to go to class. I used to be able to go to class and it just got to where it um, essentially it'll feel like I pulled both hamstrings if mm -hmm. I if I am, you know, holding poses and then literally cannot walk for four or five days oh, until yeah. it kind of oh. heals. Yeah. So it's like, all right, well, that's clearly not worthwhile. Right. And um, and of course, now with the pandemic, no one's teaching class in person. But but I found I've got this 10 minute series that I do. It's all seated. It really helps like limber my spine and kind of get everything moving and feeling good. And I've learned that if I do it after a walk, when I'm warmed up, it's more comfortable. So it's not it doesn't feel like as much of a strain. So I just want to encourage people to be open to ideas about how to move forward on some of these options. Yeah. Move and don't judge yourself. Dr. Weitzel, thank you again for being here today and sharing your knowledge with us. Please visit lindsayweitzel.com to learn more about her work. 
Um, you can hire her, she works virtually, um, and you can purchase Super Zoe the Migraine Hero on Amazon. Check out other episodes of the Resilient series on IGTV, Facebook Watch, and YouTube, and follow me at S. Weaver MPH to learn more about my upcoming book, The Migraine Relief Plan Cookbook, which is due out in spring 2022 from Surrey Books. Thanks so much for watching.